Hello and welcome. Today we're taking a look at an absolute powerhouse of a ship delivered from the Star Citizen Pipeline in 2021. A fortress in the sky and an absolute terror to ground forces, today we're looking at the Crusader Industries A2 Hercules Starlifter. The Hercules Starlifter concept was announced in early May of 2018 and delivered in 2021 to flight ready status. The A2 was the last of the Starlifter variants to be made flight ready and was made available in the 3.15 patch. The A2 is sold as a go-to warhorse and is the big sister to the C2 and M2 Starlifter variants but fills an extended role. It's capable of medium freight and vehicle transfer but comes in the configuration of a heavily armored gunship and bomber that holds a crew of eight. It caters well to those hauling cargo and vehicles through potentially unfriendly skies and destinations. The A2 was our first introduction to air-to-ground bomb warfare in Star Citizen and is truly a multi-crew monster capable of the destruction of both air and ground targets alike. Many of us witnessed firsthand how it proved to be instrumental in securing assets during the Jumptown 3.16 dynamic event. While it uses the same all-purpose tactical Starlifter chassis as the C2 and M2 variants, it comes with some significant upgrades and also differences. In comparison to the M2, the A2 retains the heavy armor and armory but is outfitted with additional remote turrets and very large air-to-ground MOAB bombs. Specifically, the A2 contains two additional underside-mounted remote turrets and two remote cannons to the already stout M2 loadout and has a dedicated turret gunner room for their control. The A2 also yields half of the M2's cargo space in favor of a devastating bomb delivery system which will be capable of multiple configurations. We'll look closer at these in a moment. The brochure also specifies an additional computer in comparison to the other variants. Let's take a detailed look at the current loadout as of Alpha 3.16.1. The A2 consists of size 3 components throughout. The cooling system relies on two Aegis Dynamics Mercury Military Grade C coolers. The power delivery is handled by two AR Military Grade C Super Drive power plants. Quantum is handled by the Waytech Pontus Grade C Military Drive, ensuring that travel times are fairly quick when traversing a system. In addition to its heavy armor for defense, the A2 is also equipped with two Gorgon Defender Industrial Full Block Grade B Military Shield Generators, providing quite a bit of additional buffer. Taking a closer look at the weapon loadout, the pilot has access to two size 5 gimbaled M7A laser cannons, as well as missile operator mode to gain access to the four size 10 MOAB bombs which are released from the hatches at the rear underside of the ship. Two size 5 OmniSky 15 cannon remote turrets can be found on either side of the front wings, each controlled separately via the turret gunner room. On the chin of the ship, we find a remote turret with two size 4 M6A laser cannons that are controlled via the cockpit gunner position. On the rear underside, we find two additional remote turrets, each containing two size 5 M7A laser cannons. Again, each turret is controlled separately from the turret gunner room. And finally, on the ship's stern, we have two more remote turrets, both containing two size 4 M6A laser cannons, which are controlled by the co-pilot from the cockpit simultaneously. Needless to say, the A2 has a tremendous amount of firepower. While the sheer amount of weapons alone make it a very frightening foe, one of the things that make it such a great threat is the amount of capacitor pool currently afforded to those weapons. In any seat I sat in during my testing, the gunner was able to fire a large amount of rounds before needing to pause for recharge. This allows the crew to apply significant sustained pressure to enemy forces. Externally, the A2 has a matte black finish with select red and white highlights and recognizable curves of the Crusader Industries design language. You can see hints of the Starliner in its lines, which is by far one of my favorite ship designs of all time. The ship pipeline team really did a wonderful job on the Hercules designs. On first approach, it's impossible to miss the sheer amount of firepower sticking out of the hull everywhere. Access to the two very large cargo ramps can be found at the front and rear of the ship. While vehicles and cargo can still be loaded via either ramp, it may be advisable to use the front ramp for larger vehicles like the Tonk, as the rear has a reduced entryway due to the added bomb system in comparison to the C2 and M2 variants. We should also note the massive VTOL thrusters the A2 has access to, making it capable of landing and taking off in almost any gravitational situation. Crew can access the ship via one of the two main ramps, but traveling along the port underside of the ship, we find a dedicated personnel elevator that gives the crew free access to the first and second levels of the ship. Let's head in now and check out the first level. 
Exiting on the first level, we find ourselves in the generous cargo bay area. At 216 SCU, it does have significantly less cargo room than the M2 or C2, but the ship roll here is slightly different and there is still room for plenty of cargo and vehicles and even a Nova Tonk if you wish. The spec sheet indicates it fits only one Tonk, but there is still quite a bit of room left over even when the Tonk is on board. Immediately beside the elevator on the port side, we come across a maintenance ladder that goes up to the second level. This allows free access for the crew members to traverse between levels should an issue arise with the elevator during an emergency situation. Forward towards the bow of the ship, we can see the two huge doors of the front cargo entrance. These can be opened and closed from the cockpit, but also via a side panel nearby. The panel allows cargo managers full access to opening and closing the doors as well as locking them. Nearby we also find a control panel for the interior lighting. There are three settings to choose from and the default is the first button which is full on. The second button dims the interior lights of the cargo bay and the third button turns the lights off completely. Opening the front cargo bay door via the panel, we can see the door swing up and away while the ramp extends outwards, allowing vehicles and cargo to be delivered. I tested driving a Tonk up into the hangar via the front ramp, and it fits with ease. There was actually quite a bit of room left inside the hangar as the front of the Tonk only came to the personnel elevator. Heading aft towards the stern of the ship, you really get a sense of how cavernous and spacious these Starlifter halls are. It's easy to picture it filled with vehicles, cargo, or even troops headed into battle. During peacetime, we could probably have a good match of sports ball if we laid down some master turf. Coming to the stern, there is a system access station off to the port side, allowing the monitoring of the ship's systems and status from the cargo bay without the need to head up to the cockpit. The A2 gives up some of the rear cargo area found in the C2 and M2 variants and replaces it with a custom bomb bay, adding even more firepower to an already impressive package. When scanning the stern of the ship, it's hard to miss the four massive MOAB bombs staring back at you from their racks. The A2 bomb system allows for two distinct loadouts as pointed out in the original manufacturer's brochure, enabling adaptable aerial bombardment as the situation requires. The A2 currently comes equipped in the Morningstar bomb configuration, which consists of the four size 10 large yield aerial bombs, which we see before us. There's also another supported configuration that will be coming to the game soon, called the Daisy Chain Saturation Rig, that will see the A2 equipped with 60 compact size 3 bombs, allowing for the ability to do carpet bombing runs as well. There is a small gate on either side of the railing that allows access to the bombs for inspection as necessary. The pilot has full control of the bomb system via the missile operator mode by pressing the middle mouse button. Once the light blue ring is in the desired location, the pilot then holds down T to lock in the bomb target, at which point the circle will turn green. While keeping the small green dot in the center, a second small green dot below will rise and enter the target zone as we approach the target. Both green dots will line up in the center once we're directly over our target and the pilot can then press the trigger and release a bomb on the unfortunate souls below. At the very back we find a rear cargo ramp and another panel for its control. Again, since the space is more restricted in the A2 variant here due to the bomb system, you're better off loading and unloading any larger vehicles from the front ramp and reserving the rear for smaller vehicles and personnel or the loading of reserve ammunition. Let's head back to the personnel elevator and check out the second level of the A2 and continue our tour. Upon reaching the second level, we are greeted by a series of component access panels and cargo storage lockers that span across the midship of the upper deck. The red panel on this side opens up to reveal access to the life support systems of the ship. To the right are storage cargo units that open up and allow access to the 8000K of shared ship inventory, where you can store or transfer items to or from your personal inventory. Heading forward briefly, we come to the exit point of the maintenance ladder that we looked at on the first level of the ship. 
The ladder seals at the top but opens up as you approach to allow access down to the first level. On the wall just beside the ladder, we find the lighting controls for the second level area. Similar to the lighting controls downstairs, we have the option to turn the lights fully on, lights dimmed, and we can also turn the lights completely off. Heading aft past the elevator on the port side, we come to the turret gunner room that is unique to the A2. The turret gunner room has four seats dedicated to the control of the extra turrets found on the A2. On the M2, this would be the auxiliary personnel area. And on the C2, this would be the recreation area. There is a large area dedicated to subcomponent access, which I expect we'll see used in the future when we're able to add subcomponents to our main system components and weapons. The two seats at the front of the room each control one of the size 5 OmniSky 15 remote turrets on the front underside of the A2. The two seats at the rear each control one of the side remote turrets on the rear of the A2's underside and each have two size 5 M7A cannons. Moving past the turret control seats, we find ourselves in the armory room similar to what we would find on the M2. Within we have access to suit and armor storage, as well as general storage access to the shared ship inventory. There is a small bench in the center that allows you to sit down and tie your boots, or just have a quick rest before suiting up for battle. Finally we come to two spacious weapon lockers on either side of the bench. Both support storage of small arms, rifles, utility devices, knives, and there's even a location for large weapons like railguns and missile launchers. Heading back to the main deck, we take a right into one of the two engineering sections on either side of the ship. This is where we find some of our main component locations. The two engineering access panels on the left and right open up to allow access to one of the size 3 power plants and coolers respectively. At the very rear, there is an engineering panel labeled no access with a warning of a contamination risk should you not yield that advice. On either side of the ship, there are two pulsating blue reactor looking devices which are part of the main engine assembly. Heading across the walkway to the starboard side of the ship, there is neon fluorescent tubing that heads into the back of the engine area, which is home to what may be the brightest light in Star Citizen. These tubes attach to the coolers on either side and look to be part of the cooling system. Towards the stern of the starboard side, we pass by two more engineering panels for the power plant and cooler access, as well as the other main engine components. On this side, however, there is a panel which opens up and gives access to what is labeled as the jump drive. The manufacturer listed on the drive is Tarsus, which comes as no surprise. Heading forward, we come to the habitation section. Making a quick right through the door inside, we find ourselves in the kitchen area of the ship. There are appliances, dishes and utensils for preparing meals while you're out in the field. The table at the rear seats four and is relatively well lit, making it a prime location for those late night card games or D&D sessions with the crew. Back inside the habitation quarters, we find some personal storage lockers which don't appear to be linked to the ship's shared local inventory. There are eight beds total within this section that allow the crew to get some rest or log out when required. Dividing the beds are two water closets located directly across from each other with stowaway facilities. Heading out, we see two more personal storage lockers and another door which exits again to the main deck of level 2. On the starboard side, we have more ship storage access as well as component access to the radar system behind the red panel should it need maintenance or repair.
Through the circular automatic doors, we find ourselves in a long corridor headed towards the cockpit. Along the way, we come across several component access panels, as well as the location of our size 3 shield generators. This corridor also contains 8 escape pods in case something goes wrong and the entire crew needs to abandon ship. If you're part of the cargo bay crew downstairs, you may want to practice climbing that ladder quickly as this is the only escape pod location. Entering the cockpit proper, we find two more component areas immediately inside the door, as well as the gunner, co-pilot, and pilot seats. The pilot and co-pilot seats are set far back when not occupied and slide up on long rails when entering the seated position. The gunner seat has access to a systems panel and the chin remote turrets on the front of the ship which contains two size 4 M6A laser cannons and a healthy amount of rounds. The co-pilot seat has access to many of the physicalized buttons and panels to assist the pilot during navigation and combat as well as access to two remote turret options. The co-pilot can have the view of either the top or bottom turret at the exterior stern of the ship, but they control both and fire both at the same time. Between the pilot and co-pilot seat, there is a small console storage area to keep small items stored and readily available. It could probably hold at least eight hot dogs or one Pico stuffed in there tightly. I'm just saying. And finally, we come to the pilot seat. The view is reasonably limited and reminds me a lot of the views we see in the MISC ships. It might cause a slight visibility problem for setting up bombing runs, but hopefully CIG gives us another view for setting up bomb targets in the future, preferably an optional view beneath the ship. Aside from the missile operator mode access, the pilot also has access to the two size 5 M7A cannons on top of the nose of the ship. They can be set to fixed, manual gimbal or auto gimbal mode. The A2 is a very interesting ship and it's definitely one that's been growing on me more and more. In the future, it would be interesting if CIG put in bombing missions for ground targets to make use of its capabilities outside of PvP. No doubt we'll see a lot more use out of the A2 as ground-based player objectives become more prevalent. The Jumptown event was our first real reason to put this ship to task and it gave us a taste of its impressive capabilities. I hope you enjoyed this review. If I've missed something or you feel something should be added, please let us know in the comments below. If this video was helpful in any way, please give us a like and subscribe, and feel free to join the Discord to chat live with the community. And as always, thank you for watching.